Postscript Media, podcast for a changing planet. Tomorrow, we're always saying that people need to pay more attention to food and climate change. It's a huge and underreported story. Well, we got our wish. It was on the front page of Monday's New York Times. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, right? The Times devoted a big chunk of page one real estate to the head of an agricultural research institute at the University of California at Davis. His name is Dr. Frank Mitloner, and he's a scientist that both of us happen to know. And what a headline. He's an outspoken defender of meat. Industry funds his research. Files show. Files show. (laughs) That's how you know this is a serious investigation. It's like the bat signal that the Times has uncovered a big scandal. (laughs) What the files show was that Mitloner's Institute, the Clear Center, is funded by livestock industry groups, which was not a surprise to those of us who know Frank because he's a very outspoken and aggressive advocate of the livestock industry. And also because, as the story even acknowledged, he and the Clear Center have been open about its industry funding. The story actually says, quote, there is no indication that Dr. Mitloner or the Clear Center violated disclosure requirements. (laughs) Okay, then. At that point, someone at the Times maybe could have asked, then why are we going to make this guy look like a corrupt criminal on our front page? It's just a really unfortunate hatchet job. And the implication of the story is that Frank's on the take. He's taking meat industry money and expressing meat industry views. But since the Times didn't find anything unclean about the money, basically it's just smearing him for his views. In the guise of smearing him for the money. Right. And we should be clear. We think Frank's messages are are a problem. Every episode on this show, we talk about how beef is the worst food for the climate. We generally don't agree with him. We don't. If you've listened to Climate Boards, you know we have a lot of problems with the livestock industry. And both of us have tangled with Frank a bit on Twitter, where he incidentally goes by at GHG Guru, right? <laughs> Greenhouse gases. But the story did not focus on any substantive problems with Frank's research. It just suggests that it's somehow nefarious that he's an advocate as well as a scientist. Of course, the Times celebrates advocacy by certain scientists. This was clearly just the wrong kind of advocacy. Look, I absolutely believe that industry-funded advocacy by scientists is a problem, but this was still a bad journalistic call. It's funny, after you called out the Times on Twitter, even some of the anti-meat voices who were piling on had to admit that, well, maybe the framing of this story wasn't so great, but Frank is still very bad. (laughs) Right. Cancel him. (laughs) There was a lot of that. But, you know, we're not media critics. We're climavores. And I think what's especially interesting about this mess from our climavorian perspective is how we should think about industry-funded research. Because so much research around agriculture, and especially about the links between agriculture and climate, has private sector support. It also raises interesting questions about how we should think about scientists who moonlight as advocates and how this kind of pseudo-scandal is going to affect the larger conversation about food and climate, which, as we keep saying, sucks. (laughs) It does. And I hate the idea of demonizing people with unpopular views on this stuff, and partly because it will make the conversation even nastier. But partly because, let's face it, we've got some unpopular views on this stuff, and I don't want us to get canceled. (laughs) Literally, we just extended our contracts. But look, when a meat scientist is front page news, we're going to talk about what it means for meat, for science, and for talking about meat and science. I'm Tamar Haspel. And I'm Michael Grunwald. And our conversations are never nasty here on Climavores, a show about eating on a changing planet. So one thing that's funny about this Times investigation is that it wasn't really a Times investigation. (laughs) The story mentions about halfway through that it was actually Greenpeace that uncovered these files. And then it sort of hilariously says that the Times obtained the documents independently as well, which, I mean, really, it's as if that 
sort of retroactively erases the handoff from Greenpeace. And and when obtaining the documents means sending an email. Yeah, right. Look, the documents do show that the animal feed industry provided funding for the Clear Center and worked with Frank on a PR campaign. And those facts are facts, right? Even Mm -hmm. when they come from Greenpeace, which has an interest in this stuff, which will be a theme in this show. It's it's funny. Tamar and I, we just realized this morning that apparently we were targets of this PR campaign. Both of us. It mentions a Washington Post writer and a political writer that sound a lot like us. They sure do. (laughs) And I was in there because I think the document said that he invited a Washington Post journalist to visit, and he did invite me. And, you know, the idea that they're collaborating and thinking they can invite me, like, so I can be their stooge and promote their message is kind of funny. But I declined. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't talk to him. Uh, He does research that is in an area I'm interested in. And I said, look, hey, if I'm ever in the area, I would definitely stop by, but I'm not going to accept their invitation to come out, which presumably means they're paying for my travel and stuff. Right. Well, what was funny is, uh, you know, I I think it's me who's in there too, because they mentioned that that Frank had an intense exchange on Twitter with a Politico writer. Um, What I think they mean is that we were fighting about plant-based meat. Um, And uh, and it's funny because this was raised uh, a bit today to suggest that maybe, you know, I was in, I was somehow in the tank and I did come out to see him, not not on his dime. And we went to go see an industrial dairy and, and I learned a lot, but again, I, I'm, I failed to see how, uh, you know, what's nefarious about any of that. But the theme of this issue, of this episode, or one of the themes, is sort of the weaponizing of conflict of interest. And it's on display here because, Mike, you're in there for disagreeing with him, and I'm in there for turning down his invitation. But as soon as you tweeted out that this was a hatchet job, people come out of the woodwork and say, huh, is it the journalists who are in the documents who are calling this a hatchet job? Yeah. Yeah, we're in the documents for disagreeing with it. I know, exactly. And of course, the New York Times leads with another anecdote that sort of sheds light on this. And that is that a couple years back, there was a report called the Eat Lancet Report that recommended a diet that, that is optimal for people and planet. And it was mostly a plant-based diet. And the most controversial thing about the report was that their recommended levels of meat consumption were extremely low. And so the Times piece leads with Frank, with his industry funding, lambasting this Eat Lancet report. And it sort of presents Eat Lancet as being this authoritative, dispassionate, scientific document. But when it came out, Lots of people in the pro-meat community were going after the authors because one of the funders of the Eat Lancet report is a Norwegian philanthropy that advocates for plant-based diets. And so, so you have this weaponized conflict of interest. One of the things you notice about these funding attacks and about conflict of interest investigations in general is that it's always about ideas you don't agree with. I keep looking for one that where people attack people who agree with them and it just never happens. Right. And it's funny. I mean, the New York Times story does talk about how how Frank said that the the authors were spreading a radical anti-meat agenda and that he was using this kind of lame hashtag yes to meat which the uh, the industry was using to. And it's sort of like, yes, you got him. He was criticizing the study. But I've got to say, there were huge problems with that study. Not necessarily the ones that that Frank identified. But I, what I remember about that study is that it sort of said, hey, yeah, you know, meat is bad for the climate. Okay, we obviously agree. But it equated, it really drew no distinction between pork and beef. Pork, which is like semi-bad for the climate, and beef, which, as we are constantly saying, is horrible for the climate. You know, look, Frank was minimizing 
meets climate problem, and he is an influential voice. But this this story made it sound like you know that it just shows what a hack he is that he would dare question this authoritative study. And you know, those of us who are in this space have known for a long time that Frank's research is industry funded because he discloses it, and also because most of the scientists—I am not going to say most. Certainly, a lot of the scientists who work on meat are funded by, at least in part, by the meat industry. And, you know, just because you're funded by the meat industry doesn't mean you're a bad source of information. One of my favorite sources of information on beef, which I understand to be from an industry perspective, is a a woman named Sarah Place. And she works for Elanco. But I find her Twitter presence to be quite reasonable. She talks about about this stuff in ways that I think are really fact-based. And I absolutely would rely on her as a source, albeit an industry source, if I'm writing about this stuff. But Frank lost me a couple years back when he tweeted, trivia quiz. The following are the ingredients of three food slash feed items. Two of them are fake burgers, impossible foods and beyond meat. And the third is premium dog food. Can you pick the latter? And then another journalist I know said, hey, Frank, that's kind of silly. And Frank replied, seemingly the ingredients of the hyped and ultra-processed plant-based burgers are indistinguishable from dog food. A few hours after posting, 130,000 people found this post interesting and intriguing, not silly. So here's this sober academic scientists like digging in on the number of clicks that indicate that it's it's it, that it's worth reposting. So yeah, he posted this thing that is designed to elicit outrage and then he wouldn't own it when he was called on it. And I butted in here and I pointed out that Frank had also posted a thing well, uh, a picture of a banana with all the chemicals in a banana to make fun of people who were afraid of chemicals in their food. And then a, a professor at George Mason University, who wrote a book on the naturalness uh, fallacy, also uh, jumped in here. And he said that anyone who pretends inspiring disgust wasn't the intention, isn't worth engaging with because they aren't being honest period. And that's when Frank lost my goodwill. Look, those of us who know Frank know that he is a supporter of animal agriculture, a supporter of the meat industry, and a really aggressive one. Um, He's, uh, you know, and so, yeah, sometimes he's trolling. He said some really dumb stuff on Twitter about, you know, renewable energy um, and just the kind of the green movement. And he deserves to be called out for it. But I do think Look, there's kind of troll Frank, but there, there, we should point out that he's not a pure troll, right? He's done some interesting things. I and mean, one example is that when the livestock long shadow, the first really important United Nations report to say that kind of, hey, climate is not just an energy problem. It's also a agriculture and particularly a livestock problem. Mm-hmm. Um, when it came out, and they showed that it was uh, it was about fifteen percent of global emissions, um, which Frank has never questioned. But then, in their press release, when they were hyping this report, the UN said that livestock is a bigger problem than transportation. And Frank correctly pointed out that they were sort of mixing apples and oranges, and by their own math, agriculture and livestock were not a bigger problem than transportation, and they had to they had to retract that, which that was sort of Frank being intelligent and, again, carrying water for the meat industry, but in a correct way. Another thing I would point out, and this I got to see when we visited an industrial dairy together, is that the main purpose of his Clear Center and a lot of his work, he's an air pollution expert, and he's working with the livestock industry to try to reduce their emissions, which is really important. Um, It's like, we need that. Um, He does not pretend that methane isn't a problem. He does not pretend that nitrous oxide is not a problem. He's working with these industries to try to reduce it. And as he points out, and sometimes he makes himself sound maybe like a little bit of a martyr for doing it, but a lot of the the agricultural 
interests that he's working with are not huge believers in climate change. And he's got a sort of heavy lift to try to convince them that, you know, he's with them, but it's important for them to try to do their part um, for the climate. And so it is good that somebody is trying to do that. And then the last thing I would say, and this goes to the whole debate over whether we need to cancel Frank, is that the guy makes some legitimate points that those of us who feel differently about meat than he does at least have to have answers to. Um, And I think we do. Um, But when he points out that, for instance, meat is just 3% of U.S. emissions or that People who say that meat is triggering deforestation, well, you don't see so much deforestation in the United States. Or that, yes, cows use land, but a lot of that land would not be otherwise useful to uh, to human beings. Um, I think there are really solid answers to those. And as you know, I think livestock are a gigantic climate problem. But just sort of waving those sorts of critiques away, um, I don't think it really does any good to the climate conversation or to the interests of people who think it's important to reduce the impact of meat. And yet we see those points being repeated over and over as though they were some kind of mic drop moment. Like, you know, the 3% of, of American emissions being due to cattle, which is true. But the reason our American cattle footprint is a small part of our footprint is because our footprint is so damn big. <laughs> right. And and it also, it also indicates, of course, that uh, cattle raised in the United States are more efficient because they grow faster. We put them in feedlots and there are fewer emissions that are tagged to them. But that sounds like a meat industry talking point, right? It just happens to be a true one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's true. And, it, and, you know, it's problematic when we talk about cattle. And we talked about that quite a bit when we did our cattle episode. and But the whole thing about this is that the problems with the discourse that Frank engages in and that Frank sort of precipitates is a nuanced, difficult story. And the Times story was an easy, gotcha story. So instead of going after him for these legitimate things, which are difficult and complicated, Um, and involve things like um, the tone of his tweets and the context of his facts. They went after him for this one thing, which is super easy and obviously generates all kinds of press. And they left out the part, actually they didn't leave it out, but I think readers elided it, that all of this information had been disclosed previously. And I think that there's a model for this. And I I, you know, sometimes I think that tobacco ruined journalism <laughs> because it was so clear that the industry was in the wrong every which way from Sunday. And they spent so much money trying to prove that cigarettes were okay. They spent so much PR time and effort and blood and treasure trying to downplay the risks. And of course, they did it behind closed doors and it wasn't disclosed. So this becomes the model for every industry, you know, intervention in a public health issue. And, you know, and there's lots of bad behavior to go around. It's good that people are holding scientists' feet to the fire. But it's like you see this replicated over and over again, and the reality is there hasn't been anything as bad as tobacco since tobacco. I mean, there's been bad stuff, but not that bad. Well, and look, we're we're not here to do a journalism episode, um, but... You know, I spent three decades working for these mainstream media institutions, and I will say that if they have a bias, it's a bias towards outrage, right? You don't write about the planes that land safely. Um, That just sort of goes with the territory. And if you're an investigative reporter, I wrote about this in my stimulus book about Obama, you've got to find like, you know, what? oh, the... There were too many stimulus projects in rural areas. And then another story saying there are too many stimulus projects in in metro areas. But you can't just do like, oh, it seems like they're just about the right amount of stimulus projects in, in those areas. <laughs> That's not a story. Like to me, there's a really interesting story to do about Frank. But it's, as you said, it's more nuanced. It's uh, it's about this ag-friendly scientist at an ag-friendly school, right? The, like 
you see Davis, the you know they're they're the Aggies. That's their that's their mascot, and he really did, I think, get kind of radicalized by criticism. You know, he felt like the vegans were picking on him because he was supporting meat, and he went off the other way and has just, I think, gone a little bit off the deep end in his criticism of his critics. He's a now he's this meat scientist who's become this very angry bulldog for the meat industry. To me, that's what's most interested about him. You know, sticking a hashtag on his, you know, on his silly tweets. <laughs> and I think to write that story, though, um, you have to be knee deep in this stuff. And, you know, you and I have been interacting with him for years, and we've also watched the space evolve over that period of time. And you kind of have to be knee deep in it for this story to really make sense to you. And so, you know, in some ways, I I always feel like I've been fortunate that I've spent my whole career on food and ag because it lets me specialize. And I think it's difficult for for reporters who who aren't basically submerged in this space to to pick out what's a story and what isn't. And I should point out that, Mike, you did, you reached out to the reporter and did not get a response. So, we did ask for that kind of answer, but we didn't get it. Yeah, the New York Times is uh, sort of famously defensive about its <laughs> about about criticisms of his stories. So, well, I suspect her inbox was pretty full after this story. <laughs> so, so I totally understand. And of course, if she has a response, we'd be happy to to post that in the show notes or talk about it in a in a future uh, episode. But like the thing about Frank is that the thing that they picked out is this thing that everybody in the space already knew. And he's funded by industry. And But it's not as though industry recruited him to become an operative. He was way pro-meat, you know, from before that. And he was also pugilistic before that. I mean, all things considered, it would be kind of weird if the meat industry didn't fund him. So... I think it's really important to talk about industry funding as a whole. And the first thing to say about it is that it is on the rise. And one of the reasons it's on the rise is that public funding for agricultural research has declined. Up until about 20 years ago, uh, it was about half and half. And then it started to diverge. And now private Uh, investment, industry investment in research is about two-thirds, and public investment is about one-third. And that leaves scientists in a really difficult spot. They need money to do their research, and there's a very limited pool of public money. So if your position is, okay, we don't want industry funding scientists, it means that for those scientists who don't get the public money— they're just out of luck. And so the choice for them right now in this landscape is take the industry money or quit and get a job bag and groceries. <laughs> right. And of course, you know, if they take the money, I guess they're, uh, you know, that then they're somehow tainted, right? According to, according to the Times and according to a lot of the people we're hearing from. It's funny. I, I laughed when, uh, when you sent me that chart about the change in public and private funding because, uh, because then I saw on Frank Mitloner's blog, he had used the same chart. <laughs> you came to it independently. But it's like the fact that he used it doesn't make the facts suddenly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's totally true. And um, But there's this a story about going grocery shopping a number of years ago. And I walk out in the parking lot and I see this beautifully restored 1930s uh, uh, Ford, I think it was. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nice. Somebody's taking their refurbished Ford to the grocery store. And then I saw who was driving and it was a guy I really don't care for much. And I I felt the swivel happen that all of a sudden I'm like, okay, what kind of idiot takes that kind of car to the grocery store? <laughs> exactly. And so this is sort of an example of how Um, our associations are important in more than a dispassionate way. Right. It's not, you know, it's hard to separate the message from the messenger. Um, But I think, you know, that's part of our job is to try. Look, from my perspective, the world is on fire, right? Climate change is, 
the huge existential threat facing humanity. And one of the big answers is going to be research. As we discuss on this show, agricultural research in particular uh, about the links between our food and our emissions. Um, We need more of it. And yet there's this sense like, well, yes, of course we need more of it, but no, 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 not if it's funded by industry. And then, of course, when we did our show about the Inflation Reduction Act, um, a lot of the response to it was like, oh, but that, yes, that's government funding, but it's just going to help, you know, some of those projects are going to end up helping Archer Daniels Midland or Tyson Foods or some other private interest, the livestock industry. We can't have that. So it's like, we can't, like, government can't fund it. Industry can't fund it. Who's going to fund it? You know, and there's this... You know, Frank is out there trying to help the livestock industry cut its emissions. And when people's reaction is like, but the guy cutting, helping them cut their emissions is bad. It's like, well, I guess it would be better if somebody with views you liked better was trying to work with the meat industry to cut their emissions. But personally, I'm just glad somebody is. Yeah, I totally get that. But the industry funding critics are absolutely correct that it can bias And I think that's super important. We have to admit it, and we can't lose sight of it. What's the Upton Sinclair quote? That you can't convince a man of to believe something if his salary depends on his not believing it. So when scientists and industry get together and they reinforce each other's ideas, then of course I think it's going to make the problem of bias worse. But I also want to point out that industry funding, and I've seen a whole lot of it in nutrition science as well as in agricultural research, funding finds its partisans more than it creates them. And so they look for scientists who are doing work that aligns with their mission. They find them and they go into partnership together. But then what happens is that It creates a silo. So those scientists, instead of spending time with people who are pushing back, are spending time with people who reinforce. And I think it really does affect the way people think. And I would be very surprised if it didn't affect the way that Frank thinks, too. There's there's certainly something to what Upton Sinclair said. And I would even add to it that it's not just— it's not just about the money, right? It's hard to convince somebody somebody to believe something when their sort of self-image depends on them not believing it. I see in, in my biofuels world, there's a lot of terrible science that's done by scientists who have been working on biofuels for their whole careers. And it's kind of, you know, it's hard for them to wrap their brains around the fact that like, hey, maybe I've just been wasting my time. And they come up with a lot of really preposterous, you know, ex post facto justifications um, for why their science actually works. Um, But what I would say, and look, so there's no question that it can have a biasing effect. What I would say is like, I can go to those biofuel studies that these guys are doing and show what's wrong with them. What I would say is like, let's, let's try to focus on the substance here. Like we don't question the truth of the facts in the New York Times story just because Greenpeace found them, right? The facts are the facts. Frank science should also stand on its own. I mean, the tobacco when the tobacco science that was showing that somehow lung, you know, t- cigarette smoking doesn't cause lung cancer, there were all these respectable sciences, scientists showing exactly how that was bogus, that it was just muddying the waters. But a lot of the stuff we're talking about here is less is less clear cut, and it's worth having debate about it. So I'm going to push back a little bit because when I talk about industry-funded research in, say, nutrition, and there's a whole lot of it, um, I get sort of the same response where somebody will say, we have to evaluate it on the science. But the problem is that the science can be awfully hard to evaluate. Sure, you can see obvious problems, but unless you have access to the data, you know how the statistical analysis was done, and you're willing to spend the time to recreate it, you can't know whether there was p-hacking involved. And that's before 
you're not in the room where they decide which question to ask that's tailor-made to make their point. There are all kinds of ways to manipulate research, and if there weren't, we wouldn't be having this replication crisis. There are all kinds of ways to manipulate science and research in ways that are pretty opaque. And so when it has an industry imprimatur on it, and there is research that shows that the body of research funded by industry has a different skew of results from the body of research that's funded uh, publicly, you have to take that into account when you're looking at science. You can't just put it aside and say, I'm going to evaluate the science. Well, and that's why disclosure is so important too, right? I mean, and if and if Frank hadn't disclosed, if he had been trying to pass himself off as just a purely disinterested observer, um, you know, I think we would both have a real problem with that. Yes, um, we would. Uh, but look, I mean, I, I think of, for instance, uh, your your current employer and my alma mater, the Washington Post, they take Chevron ads, right? Does that mm-hmm. mean they also happen to do the best climate coverage in the business? Um, mm-hmm. It's not all fruit of the poison tree. Um, I think it's worth noting, and some people are, you know, going crazy about the fact that they take Chevron ads. And I think reasonable people can disagree about whether it's a good idea or not. I think even you and I disagree about uh, about whether they should be taking that money. But I think the larger point is that at some at some point, you know, the answer to if you think science is flawed, the the answer is well, let's do have better science. If you think speech is flawed, <laughs> let's have better speech. Um, you know, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of like, you know, that research had an industry funding, um, so therefore we're not even going to pay attention to it because then, like you know, like you said, we're only going to pay attention to a third of the agricultural research out there. Right. And and the thing is, I think that, it, like I said, I think industry funding is problematic. And in some ways, it sort of makes you an advocate because it, it's hard to not be on the side of the hand that, fe- that feeds you. But I've known lots of scientists who take industry money to do research who are terrific. And and I don't dismiss them out of hand. And the good ones always disclose. In fact, I think disclosure on research has now become the norm rather than the exception. And I think that's happened in, in the last, you know, 15 years or so. And uh, and Frank is, is not beyond the pale. Frank is actually dealing with facts and he's actually dealing with 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 research. And so I think we have to engage with that. And yeah, I stepped away from engaging with him because of the tone he takes and the arguments that he makes on Twitter, but I still engage with the arguments he makes. And I think one of the big takeaways here is that when you when a scientist is an advocate the way Frank is and he wouldn't deny that that he is an advocate for animal agriculture and the livestock industry that it is it is appropriate to take what he says in that light and i think both of us would add and then when he does stupid trolly things like say you know Impossible burgers are like pet food um, because they both have a lot of ingredients. Um, you know, he's got to own that. And in our discussions these last few days, he he has. That said, it's you know it would it would be nice. It's convenient for some people who have an interest in just saying, and therefore everything he does is a lie, um, and we don't have to deal with his uh, you know with with what he believes or what his science shows and and anybody who's defending him is clearly in the tank with him i think that's where we're uh, we're getting off the train and that's what makes me worried for the state of food discourse so i think that the industry slash academic silo gets legs out in the world and of course the scientists sort of lend legitimacy to it. And that's the whole point. And that's what, if you read the the Greenpeace piece on this, obviously the beef industry wants to get Frank in their pocket because he's, they think, a more credible advocate than they are because they're the industry. But of course, by taking industry money and working so closely with industry, they become one and the same. And that's what the New York Times peace was about, but it just went about it in a ham-fisted kind of way. Frank is 
unabashedly trying to shape the public narrative about beef. And when he reached out to me and invited me to come visit his lab at UC Davis, it was exactly the same thing as Greenpeace reaching out to the New York Times with their story about Frank. It's an attempt to get mainstream media on their side and shape the narrative. And I think that's a problem. Well, look, I think, you know, so it's interesting kind of trying to unpack what the problem was that the New York Times was writing about, right? Because obviously they were saying, like, here's this scientist, but really he's an industry-funded advocate. And then, uh, mm-hmm. and then it's sort of like in parentheses, there's actually nothing wrong with the industry funding. <laughs> and so then what you realize is like, huh, this is a scientist who's actually an advocate. But of course, they don't have a problem with... You know, there's some very, you know, the James Hansons and uh, Catherine Hago and very, Michael Mann and very prominent scientists who are have become very prominent advocates warning about the climate crisis. Of course, nobody has a problem with them. They're, they're heroes. But it shows that the problem isn't that scientists having opinions and, you know, trying to push, push messages and being advocates. The problem is what Frank is advocating for. Some advocacy is uncontroversial and celebrated, Frank is advocating for the meat industry, which, at least in this article, was sort of portrayed as like advocating for the tobacco industry. Right. And if it were, and you could say, okay, well, it's because of industry funding, but if it were like industry-backed battery research or solar panels, I think a lot of people would have less of a problem. It's this one-two punch of industry funding from an industry I don't like. And and I think I think that's the problem. I don't think that that the industry funding is the entire problem, but I also don't think that the 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 substance of the ideas is the entire problem. I, I think it's both. But I don't think people can separate these things. I mean, everybody wants a shortcut to think that something is good or something is bad. And we see this all the time when we did our, our local agriculture episode, um, that that local agriculture is good for some things, and it's so tempting to think that it's good for everything. Ditto organic agriculture. Ditto just about everything. People want to slot things into categories. This is good or this is bad. And people have slotted beef um, as bad. They've slotted industry funding as bad. And they've slotted Frank as bad. And so the the public talk about this particular article was really problematic because nobody seemed to want to think, except us and a few other people, that, okay, yeah, Frank is problematic, but the article is problematic also. But as as long as it attacked a thing that they didn't like, people were okay with it under the, you know, enemy of my enemy doctrine. That's right. And I do think we have to think about, well, okay, well, what is bad? And is it like, is it the fact that, uh, like, is the fact that an industry is is financing research? No, we do not think that is bad. In fact, what is bad is that the, as somebody pointed, Dan Regto from the, uh, from the Breakthrough Institute was pointing out, the meat industry is doing a terrible job of not funding enough research. They have a big they have a big program where they're trying to investigate ways to reduce methane emissions and this is like companies like JBS and Nestle and they've put up 2.5 million dollars over five years for the methane problem, which is a gigantic problem in heating up the planet, they should be doing 10, 100 times that much. Um, so clearly, we're not, a, you know, nobody can honestly say with a straight face that they don't want the industry contributing to research. Um, you know, is the problem that they're also trying to convince people of what's right? Um, I think, you know, pretty clearly <laughs> that's, that's sort of within industries and Frank's right to, they think something is important to try to make the case for it. So I, I really do think that ultimately what is being targeted here is wrong think. Um, it's just not the industry we like. And people can argue about whether the meat industry is the tobacco industry, but we're often making cases like we, we had an episode where we talked about animal welfare. We had an, and for instance, meat, like beef is 
better for animal welfare than than the, the poultry and pork, and, certainly. and pork or chicken, while chicken and pork are better for the climate. And there's, these things have, you know, there are ups and downs to all of them, and we have to be able to weigh them. We can, I think we can't just say, like, hey, if the meat industry has, has a position, say, like, you know, we need higher meat yields, which is something that you and I both believe very strongly, and that the American meat industry is doing an excellent job of improving its meat yields, which is, I think, pretty much just clear fact. Do those views just get canceled because they happen to be supported by an industry that a lot of people, for some totally plausible reasons, don't like? I just think that's a that's a real problem. And let's be honest, since there are times when we agree with the meat industry, we don't want agreement with them or their ideas to be beyond the pale. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. It's the beyond the pale issue. And one of the things that I think has happened over the last several years, not just in food, but in other walks of life, that more and more positions have become beyond the pale. That is so distasteful or so clearly wrong that we don't engage with them. And there are issues that are beyond the pale. I, you know, I, nobody should be defending Nazis at this point. And the climate is changing and people are responsible. Gravity is a thing. The <laughs> earth is round. But this kind of certainty tends to have mission creep. And I think as we've lowered the bar on issues for beyond the paleness, we're dismissing things that we ought to be engaging with. And I think that's the problem I had with the New York Times article, that it was an exercise in washing your hands of ideas you didn't like. And once again, here on Climavores, we have come to the rousing conclusion that people should be having honest conversations about food and climate. Tamar, could you perhaps recommend a podcast where people can have honest conversations about food and climate? And, you know, we might be wrong, but at least we're honest. That could be our motto, Climavores. We might be wrong, but at least we're honest. Wrong but honest since 2022. Climb of Wars is a production of Postscript Media. And if you have non-biasing ad dollars to spend, we want to hear from you. So give us a call at 508-377-3449 or drop us an email at climbofwars at postscriptaudio.com. The show is hosted by me, Tamar Haspel. And me, Michael Gronwald. Scott Clavenna and Stephen Lacey are the executive producers. Senior editor is Ann Bailey. Managing producer is Cecily Mesa Martinez, and Dalvin Abawaje is the associate producer. Engineering is by Sean Marquin and Greg Vilfranc. Postscript Media is unfortunately not supported by Tyson Foods or Smithfield. <laughs> it's supported by Prelude Ventures, but our phone lines are open. Prelude is a venture capital firm focused on climate solutions across energy, food, agriculture, transportation, logistics, and advanced materials. We hope you'll spread the word, give us a rating, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We're also streaming on Amazon Music. And if you know somebody else who would like us, let them know. And if this show didn't piss you off, come back next week and give us another try. Mm-hmm.